we indeed shall behold him one day. And uh, why don't you take your Bibles and turn to one of the last chapters in the Bible, Revelation chapter 20. lot going on in this passage and there's different ideas about what might this might be talking about. We're going to focus on the last part of it. So I'm going to read the whole chapter, but we're going to focus on the, the last part. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having a key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and they reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. They will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. In number, they are like the sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who is seated on it, earth and sky, fled from his presence. There was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Well, those first six verses, those might be some of the most debated verses in the whole Bible. This, what, is, what are these thousand years? When, when is that? And what is that exactly talking about? And there's, there's a bunch of different views on that and how you interpret that. You're, you're either pre-millennial or post-millennial or amillennial, and there's all, we could, I could give you a whole theological lecture on that, but I won't get into that this morning. Uh, but those are, those are debated. Those, those verses have different ideas about them. But verses 7 through the end, there's a lot more agreement on those. And those are the ones that, that I'm going to focus on this morning. And there's a lot of good news in those verses. So first of all, the final judgment will bring a final completion to all the wrongs in the world. It's going to be complete. All of the wrongs in the world, the door is going to be shut. It's the end is going to come and everything is going to be answered for. When Christ comes again, it's going to be complete. Things are going to be finished. And all of the loose ends here and now, those will be tied up. And there's a lot of loose ends, as many of us know. 
And I have no idea how those loose ends are going to be tied up or exactly how that's going to happen, but, but we read here that they will be tied up. So a final completion. The end is going to be complete. Nothing is going to be unturned or undone. Those verses 7 through 10 on my Bible, it says Satan's doom on the heading there. Uh, just you notice here that Satan was locked up in this prison for a thousand years and then and then there was like this this good time here and then and then Satan has to be released from this prison. It doesn't say why he has to be released, it just says that he has to. And then and then he's released and as soon as he's released he deceives basically what it sounds like the whole world or almost all the nations and then he gathers them all to surround God's people and attack them and then as soon as he appears and deceives everybody, suddenly he's gone. As soon as this uncountable army arises, fire comes from heaven and they're gone. That's, that's how powerful God is here. As quickly as Satan arises with this uncountable army, he's defeated. He's gone. It's, Satan definitely is a, a mighty force in our lives. He has uncountable forces with him. And, and this, is, this is true for us too. We, we, we need to not dismiss Satan, but Satan, though a mighty force next to God, is not even a contest. As soon as he rises, he's defeated. He gets like a couple sentences right here. That's it. As soon as he comes, he goes. Now with us, we can't hold a candle to him. He's, he would easily overpower and destroy each one of us if he could. But next to God, if, you, if you're in Jesus Christ, you don't have to worry about Satan. He is a force to be reckoned with, and under our own strength, absolutely not. But next to God, we don't have to be afraid. As soon as he arises, he's gone. And he is among the first to be thrown into this lake of fire that it talks about. He was the first offender, and he's going to be first into the lake of fire. You notice at the beginning of the passage, it kind of goes through all the different titles for this this monster person thing, whatever you want to call him. He sees the dragon, the ancient serpent, kind of reminding you of the garden there, who is the devil or Satan. Uh, all the key names for, for him there. Whatever you want to call him, he's, he's locked up and then he's thrown into the lake of fire. He's gone. Not even a contest. Now, verse 11. Revelation can be a kind of intimidating book, but it doesn't, it doesn't have to be. If you, I, I always look at it as like, it's just like a, a picture book of pretty much what, what the rest of the Bible says. It talks about, for example, it's verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne. Okay? Now, when you hear white... That can symbolize, or you can think of purity, something holy, a throne. When you think of a throne, what do you think of? You think of maybe a chair, a place where kings sit. Some, this is where rulers, people who have power, they sit on thrones. Okay? So God, verse 11, God is seated on the throne. He has ultimate power and authority. And there's, if you look through the whole book of the Bible, there's, there's a throne there. And so this kind of goes back to that. But God has ultimate power and authority. And then it says, earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for them. Earth and sky fled. That's really hard to picture. Earth and sky fleeing? I mean, what's, what's left? I mean, that, that's a little hard to picture, but essentially, the first heavens and earth are, are no more. They're gone. 
Or, in other words, there's no more status or possessions or titles. There's no, no more of that. There's just going to be people and their actions left. When that last day comes, we're not going to have any of the, the fancy stuff that we carry around with us anymore. We're just going to have us and our lives. It'll be a, a great equalizer. It says the dead in verse 12, great and small. But if you take away earth and sky, there's not a whole lot for us to brag about anymore. There's just us. In verse, verse 12, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. So imagine, imagine God seated on this great white throne. And then imagine just a sea of people as far as you can see. Again, this is all about images and pictures. So as you're reading, think of the pictures. You have this sea of people, all the people who, who've ever lived there. And then books were opened, it says. Books were opened. It says two different books actually are open. It says the first are, are books. And this is probably a record, a records of all we've done. <clears throat> These are probably records of all we've done. And in, in um, some other ancient literature, there are, it says there are books in which are written the sins of all those who have sinned. That's kind of a frightening thought, isn't it? To think that all of our sins are written down somewhere. But that's probably what this is alluding to. Now, the way I, I just imagine it in my mind, um, I, I imagine more of like video clips or something like that. Because the bottom line is that nobody is going to get away with anything in life, ever. Nobody's going to get away with anything. In Ecclesiastes 12, verse 14, the very last verse, it says, For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. There's a lot of stuff that our courts and our eyes miss. There's many evils that go unjudged and totally missed. And there's people who think that they can get away with these things. So, for example, just some bigger things. There are war crimes tribunals in nations around the world because terrible atrocities have happened. Tons of people were killed. So, for example, Bosnia and Rwanda. Maybe those are only names to you, but, but there were people there that were singled out because of their race and they didn't belong there and so to get those people out they were just exterminated and only a few people have gone to trial and it's been about 20 years for both of them only a few people have gone to trial Tons of evil has been done there, and only a handful of people have seen justice. Or we could talk about Wall Street, the financial crisis of 2007 and 8 and 9, and afterwards. You talk about how many banks gave out loans that they knew couldn't be paid back, how many people were set up for failure. How many people lost their homes? How many people lost their jobs? And how many people knew that this would happen? How much fraud actually happened? Nobody went to jail. None. They say only a fraction of 
domestic violence and rape is actually reported, only a small fraction of it, let alone prosecuted. And then there's all of this underground world of, of human trafficking that goes on. Tons of evil in this world goes unreported, unnoticed. There's, there's a lot of examples where we could cite where we'd say there's no justice in this world. But in the end, nobody is going to be saying that anymore. And while our courts will fail, the, gu the guilty are acquitted and the innocent are condemned in our courts, nobody's, no guilty is going to be acquitted and no innocent is going to go free in the end. Nobody's going to get away with anything. God is a perfect judge, perfectly just. That should make us tremble a little bit, even for those of us who are in Christ. The Bible actually says that all people will stand before God, including believers. All people. Ecclesiastes 3.17 God will bring to judgment both the righteous and the wicked for there will be a time for every activity, a time for every deed. Now one more, I want to mention this Romans 14 You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Every one of us. We're going to be standing there. We're going to have to answer for what we've done. Now, we, this is kind of a difficult thing because sometimes the Bible will say and emphasize two different things. So we have some verses that will talk about our sins already taken away. They're gone. They're forgiven. They're on the ocean floor. There's verses that talk about that. And if, you know, afterwards, you, if this sermon, you might make an argument, say this, the sermon was a little off balance. You, you can pull up a lot of verses and passages that talk about our sins are gone. They're taken away. They're, we're saved by grace. And that, and that is definitely true. But there's other verses, too. There's other verses that talk about a final account of all of our actions. And I mentioned just two up there, but there's a couple more. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. Think about it. Not just our actions, but our motives are going to be exposed. So imagine, imagine everything, not only that you've ever done, but everything you've ever thought. Everything that's ever lingered in your heart. All of the anger, the lust, the greed, the pride. All of that being exposed. I kind of picture it like on a, on a big screen right in front of God. Kind of horrifying, isn't it? I'm, I'm, I'm a little trembling just thinking about it. <coughs> but there's a lot of them. Second Corinthians 5.10 We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Ephesians 6.8 Because you know that the Lord will reward everyone whatever good he does. Colossians 3.25, anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong, and there is no favoritism. God is a perfect judge. Revelation 22, behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give everyone according to what he has done. Now, maybe some of you are like me, where it's kind of easy to think, Okay, I've been saved by grace, and uh, it's easy to just kind of think, well, I'm, I'm, I can do whatever I want with immunity a little bit. 
Now, I don't think those words in my head, but it's easy to think, oh, I've been saved by grace, I, I can just kind of take it easy. Well, no. I've been saved by grace, for sure. But that doesn't mean I can do whatever I want. I'm still going to be, I'm still going to have to stand and give an account for what I've done before God. God is a perfect judge. And so, all of the decisions that I've made, I'm going to have to explain those. If I've hurt and offended people, I'm going to have to explain that. If I've done wrong, especially when I knew better, I'm going to have to look God in the eye and say, what was I thinking? I don't know exactly how that's going to go, but we have a lot of Bible verses here and lots of parts of the Bible that say we have to give an account of ourselves to God. That doesn't mean we're not saved by grace. I'm going to get to that in a minute. It doesn't mean that our actions don't mean anything. They do mean something. So we are saved by grace, but we still have to pay attention to our lives. But I think that some of you might think this goes a little far. I can accept that. But through reading through the Bible, I think it's fair to say that we are going to see our sin fully before the perfectly righteous God. So again, I, the way I imagine it, this is not gospel, this is just the way I put it together. I imagine standing before the throne and books, the books are open and there's this jumbotron right there. Again, this is just the way I picture it. And on this jumbotron goes through my entire life. All the, the, the good things that I've done that all the bad things that I've done. All my good thoughts, but all my bad thoughts. And, and before the perfectly holy, righteous God, I'm, I'm seeing these things that I've done and thought and felt, and I'm just... I can, I can just kind of hang my head. I know, that, I know that I'm sinful, I know that I'm per imperfect, and I know that I don't, I don't deserve this. God doesn't deserve this. What, what have I done? What was I thinking? I'm so ashamed. All that's going to be there. But that's not the end. Because it doesn't just say books are open. It says another book was open. Which is the book of life. The second is that book of life, and that probably lists all those who are saved in Jesus Christ. So as I'm, as I'm here, and all my sins are right on this big screen, for right in front of God, not like he didn't know it, but this is time to give an account. And I'm, I'm just hanging my head in shame. Then there's another book that's open. Or Jesus stands up and, as my defense attorney and says, Aaron Breesman, I, I'm forgiving him. His sins are covered. He's saved by grace. I die for him. I move that, that uh, we declare him not guilty. Not guilty. That's grace. Not that what I did doesn't matter. It does. <coughs> but I'm not saved by what I do. And none of us will be. In the end, it will be Jesus and only Jesus who saves us from our sins. Those names written in the book of life, those are the names of those who belong to Jesus and he is going to stand up for us on that last day and say, those sins are covered. I'm standing up for this one. Those sins are forgiven. Those are wiped away.
So the books of our actions will condemn us. The book of life is salvation in Christ. We will have no excuses. Because we will, we will be face to face with God and what we are and what we've done. God sees all, knows all, he's perfectly just. But we are going to be saved by grace and grace alone and by Christ alone. In verse 13, maybe this is just a jumble of images here. It says, the sea gave up its dead, the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what he had done. Okay, first of all, what this is kind of saying altogether is that nobody is going to escape God's final judgment. Okay? Doesn't matter whether you're laid, laid to rest in a, in a cemetery, whether your ashes scatter somewhere, or if you're eaten by a shark, you're not going to escape. Okay? Everybody is going to be standing there, no matter what happens to us, on that last day. So the sea, especially back then, especially back then, I mean, today we have deep sea diving and stuff. But back then, the sea was an unsearchable abyss. If you drop something in the drink back then, it's gone. You're not getting that back. So, you, yeah, the sea is the place where if you fell in there, it, it's, it's gone. It's gone. You can never get it back. So, this place where nothing ever comes back, all of the sea gives up its debt. So even for God, the most unsearchable corners of the world, even if that's where you're buried, God is still going to find you, and you are still going to be coming up out of the sea. So can you just imagine, like, for example, Lake Michigan, people just walking up out of the water there. That's what it'll be like. So the sea is an unsearchable abyss. God's going to find you there. Death. Now, we all have these images of the Grim Reaper and, and that sort of a thing. And, and for them, the Grim Reaper was kind of a real thing, or at least for a lot of people back then. And so, and so the idea is that death is not going to be an out for us. If you've died before the Lord comes, that doesn't mean that God's going to forget about you doesn't mean you're going to miss this final judgment. So death is the grim fate of all those who are under sin. All of us are looking at death one day. And that's not a pleasant thought. And for those left behind, it's very painful, as many of you know. But this is not the end of the story. Hades. Hades there's a lot that can be said about this, but it's essentially the mythical realm of those who died. We don't really believe in a Hades today, but back then, Hades, and we did a Hebrew word on this a number of years ago already, called Sheol. In the Old Testament, it's translated to the grave, because they, they believed mostly that when you died, you would go into the ground, and then, and then you'd kind of exist in this gloomy place called Sheol and just well, if you put a bunch of Bible verses together to try to describe it, it sounds like this, this really unpleasant place where the dead are and it's kind of like people are just like zombies there it's just not really nice at all so it's like the, the kind of the whole picture here is that no matter what happens to you when you die you're going to be found when you die, you're not going to escape God's judgment. This final count on the, the end of the day, you're not going to escape that. There's nowhere to hide. So no matter where your body is laid to rest, God will find you. You're not going to get away with anything. Nobody's going to get away with anything. 
Jesus said this in John 5, Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. All of us are going to hear his voice and come out. And then, finally, verse 14, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Death and Hades get thrown into the lake of fire. Verse 14, death is swallowed up in victory. That arch enemy that has caused so much pain and so much distress and anxiety and trouble is going to be gone. Into the lake of fire forever. Death is swallowed up in victory. This is the good news. Death is not the end. Death is not going to win. In fact, death is already lost. The check just hasn't been cashed yet. But it's written. And it's written in the blood of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, And the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. When all is said and done, Jesus will win. Satan, sin, and death will lose. Not just for a while, but forever. Forever. They will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. In Greek, it literally reads, into eternity of eternities. Gone forever. We can rejoice that our sins are covered and that our enemies will be defeated. In uh, the Apostles' Creed, we say that Christ is going to come to judge the living and the dead. You would uh, look at the screen here with me. How does Christ's return to judge the living and the dead and comfort you? In all my distress and persecution, I turn my eyes to the heavens and confidently await as judge the very one who has already stood trial in my place before God and so has removed the whole curse from me. All his enemies and mine, he will condemn to everlasting punishment. But me and all his chosen ones, he will take along with him into the joy and the glory of heaven. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for sending Jesus Christ so that we would be saved by grace and our sins would be forgiven. Thank you, Lord, for defeating sin and death and, Lord, for giving us the victory over them. And Lord, may we look forward to that day when their downfall will be sealed forever. And we're so glad, Lord, that we can look forward to this. Lord, may we not take your grace for granted. May we give thought to our ways and consider that, Lord, you are a just God who is going to judge. But Lord, may we not be terrified. May we, Lord, instead fear and respect you as our Lord and seek to follow you in all we do and say. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.